Good evening. I'm John Russell, Professor of Landscape Architecture and Coordinator of this year's Guest Lecture Series. This marks the 21st renewal of our Guest Lecture Series here at the College, and we think this evening certainly opens up this, this year's Guest Lecture Series in a very, very good way. I might just uh, It's a distinct pleasure for me to 
open, as John mentioned, the 1987 guest lecture series here at the college. I had that privilege back in 1976, and when I was asked to present the opening lecture this year, I have thought of the 11 years of involvement of faculty and students in the community-based projects program here, and it astounds me the number of projects and I think the very real impact that this college has had in both the small towns and the inner cities of the state of Indiana. What I'm going to share with you this evening is by far our most massive effort in terms of quantity and I would like to think in terms of quality and I would have to believe that this college made a difference at the 10th Pan Am Games in terms of the environmental quality of both the sporting venues and Indianapolis as a city. Uh, a few words about the community-based projects program uh, that John mentioned. Uh, it's a program that uh, many of us have put many hours into in the belief that hands-on learning experience uh, for and by students is one of the really major ways in which students learn all of the different uh, constraints and all of the different opportunities that they will face as practicing architects and landscape architects, planners, uh, preservationists. Um, and so student education is certainly the major reason why many of us do the CVP program. Secondly, we believe that we are involved in the very important task of uh, public education. And I guess we can assume that if we have an informed citizenry, then we will all have more informed clientele or clients, and more importantly, we will have citizens of communities better able to partake and participate in the planning and design process. So public education is certainly a major reason why we conduct community-based projects. And I would have to think that a lot of the Pan Am experience was one of education, uh, oftentimes uh, against what I would consider to be great odds, uh, three steps up and two and a half steps back, but nevertheless, I guess, moving down the road. Thirdly, we provide uh, technical assistance, whether that's a small town seeking some input on revitalization, or in this case, the look committee of the 10th Pan Am Games needing planning and design assistance. And in a very real sense, coming to us in the 11th hour, or at maybe the 11th and quarter hour, uh, asking for some design input, and I will chronologue that involvement. And lastly, for those of us on the faculty, and I hope graduate and undergraduate students, it gives us namely what we would consider the fourth goal of the program, and that is what we would consider to be applied research in, in, in urban planning, urban design, urban studies, uh, community uh, uh, involvement in the design process. So the program really does many, many things, and we think probably the Pan Am effort uh, really uh, uh, dealt with every one of those goals and objectives. With that, I think it's best if we move along. I'm going to do a three-part series. I know I'm up, I'm up against the Giants and the Bears. If it was the Jets, I would really condense this presentation, but it's not. It's the wrong team from New York. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'm going to do a three-part series, but I am going to move rather rapidly. The first part is going to be a story. I am basically going to try to tell the story of the Ball State design team in the exact chronological order that it took place. Uh, with my massive record keeping, you will see that uh, uh, that was absolutely no problem at all. Uh, the use of, as you well know, my favorite friend, the computer, assisted me greatly, and I will show you how that did assist me. Uh, then what I would like is to simply acknowledge some people I may be so presumptuous as to present my own bronze, silver, and gold awards for the design team. And then lastly, I would like to present a very small piece that is really a combination of my images and that of uh, Rob uh, Pleva, who I will introduce, set uh, to music that I hope the words of which are very meaningful when it comes to the experience that at least I've had in the last 11, uh, in the last 11 months. So with that, if we could have the lights and I'll use this electronic slide advancer here. Well, half of it worked. Okay. Well, we can turn it off again. Uh, okay. Good. I 
yes, there are points in time when various forces or actions come uh, together. And in this case, we're really talking about the College of Architecture and Planning at Ball State University somewhat coming to interface with the 10th Pan Am Games that, as many of you know, came to Indianapolis rather late in terms of planning for a major international sporting event. In fact, the city of Indianapolis had approximately two and a half years or 30 months to do what most cities have basically seven years to accomplish. And so certainly the entire effort, including Ball States, was a very, very pressured involvement from a time uh, perspective. I want to get this right yet. Uh, I went back and actually found that the critical memo that uh, I guess in my uh, somewhat uh, mental fringe state I wrote to those individuals up there uh, uh, talking about the fact uh, that I thought it would be very appropriate for us as a college hosting the eminent distinguished professor Miguel Roca from Argentina, a Pan Am country last winter quarter, if we would dovetail into the Pan Am games in some fashion. And in fact, my initial discussions took place the preceding spring, spring of 86, with Jim Browning, who was in fact a member of the Look Committee, the group that we worked with. Uh, Jim and I talked when I was working with his office on the design of the Ball State Physical Education Building, and uh, we said, uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity for Ball State. Well, spring came and went, summer came and went, we found ourselves halfway through fall quarter, and we had no involvement at all. And then uh, a phone call to Jim Browning got me involved with two people who Uh, I will never forget, and I'm sure they will never forget me. Uh, and that is Dave Shane and Sid Weedman, the two prime movers of the Look Committee. Now, both of these gentlemen are lawyers by background. Dave Shane practices law when he's not planning Pan Am games. And Sid Weedman on the right, your right, is the executive director of the White River Parks uh, Commission. And these two gentlemen, I think some of you will remember, came to Ball State. And after my reply that said, I think this college can provide more than an Emmons Distinguished Professor, I think what we could primarily do is to come up with a design charrette between December the 2nd and December the 18th, in which we would try to uh, have the faculty and students volunteer some sketch design and planning uh, problems. And I would have to say that the response of this faculty was absolutely astounding in the sense that we had 16 faculty members representing over 200 students in their studios take various uh, projects. Well, I need to hold on here for a second, folks. Um, we we organized the studio, and probably that right slide is not large enough. We organized, my responsibility basically was to help organize this massive, massive effort. And some of you may remember the fifth floor at the landing of this staircase out here, which really became the information board. And the basic uh, notion was to organize faculty and students in a way that could, in fact, respond to a host of design opportunities. Uh, Yes, technology just does not like me. I'm going to. Um, one of the things we did, of course, as a faculty is several of us went down and we took a bus tour with Dave and Sid. And in fact, we toured various sites. And we got our first real impression of the massiveness of this planning and design effort that was going to have to take place in a very short eight months. It really was mind boggling to me that the book committee of the Pan Am Games had not really done very much really intensive planning and design work. They had several offices that were donating time. HDG was doing a 
massive set of drawings. These were drawings simply of existing facilities that then planning could be overlaid on. And Browning Day Mullins Deardorff were donating some time for both the planning of the village and the, uh, the equestrian site down in uh, Monroe County. But other than that, for the most part, there had been no design work done as of December 1st, 1986. And so our challenge was, uh, to say the least, rather massive. I'm going to get this right, folks, before I go on, so just give me a second here. Will this do simultaneous uh, slides, or am I? Pardon me? I have to do a split second apart. That's great to know. That wasn't on the instructions here, and I will do that now. Okay, folks, I'm going to line up two bus rides here, and then we're going to be all in sync. Okay, now I'm going to hit these buttons a half a second apart, I think. It's very difficult when your fingers are my, uh, as big as mine are, and, uh, oh, okay. This is a real advancement, no doubt about that. Um, one of the things we did is we visited many of the facilities, and certainly Indianapolis was extremely fortunate in having world-class facilities already available. We were not put into many situations where any major facility had to be built. But one of the things that was very, very uh, uh, quick to realize is that we also, in fact, saw many liabilities. It was interesting always to go to the back of an athletic facility and to see the lack of design that was given to what was going to be, for instance, the VIP area, which is a good lesson to learn that obviously the backs of buildings might also someday have to be used for very, very important uh, functions. Um, we were given much work, and I apologize for that being backwards. Um, uh, there had been a lot of work done. Some of you may have seen the little TV special and the fact there was a competition held. We did not do the logo. That is a misnomer that some people are under. We did not design the logo. The logo was designed two and a quarter years ago by an Indianapolis firm that won the competition. The sport grams are obviously taken from an international, basically accepted notion of the sports. The X, of course, stands for the 10, the Roman numeral 10, and Indianapolis being the crossroads of the world. And the, the, the graphic artist actually did a very nice job in terms of explaining that. There was also some work done by um, a graphic design firm uh, the rendering of which you see on the left, and I will leave that to your own opinion as to the graphic impact of that. And John Heron's students had done some work, a photograph of which you see on the right. So I would be wrong in saying that no design work was done, but certainly the design work that had been done was not serving the needs of the Paxi Look Committee. Uh, people, of course, had traveled elsewhere and were bringing to us designs that they had seen and that they had liked. And of course, some graphics had already been applied. And so we were not starting in any means with absolutely no design notion, but we were starting pretty much at ground zero, or we had to fight the notion that you can do, you can take a van and you can put every design thought in the world on it, and I guess that becomes good graphics. Some of you remember December 2nd, um, I guess that's the day of infamy for the Pan Am design team around here. Uh, that's when Dave Shane and I spoke to in this very room to this group, many of you who were in that, about what was going to happen in the next three weeks. And I don't think either Dave or I had any idea of how this college would respond. Dan Woodford's class traveled to uh, Michigan City to look at the yachting venue. Andy Seeger's class traveled to Eagle Creek to look at the rowing venue. The freshmen visited the IUPUI campus in order to look at facilities for the various venues there. We began looking at 
what was the impact of all of the infrastructure? What would the velodrome be like as seen from the interstate? And what would it be to look at sitting up in the stadium and to look at the light stanchions at the track and field? When it really didn't matter, one of the great things about Ball State students is they get the job done. And when we visited the velodrome, we were a little bit ahead of schedule and the uh, venue coordinator was not there. But obviously that never de uh, deters the Ball State students from doing an on-site visual analysis. The nicest thing for me was to see the educational process take place in this building. There was truly a massive exchange of ideas, both one-on-one -on -one and in terms of a group effort. It took place at desks, it took place in the corridors, and I think for two and a half weeks, I think most of us would agree that there was really a massive focused effort on an array of projects, from banners to totems to kiosks to, um, to what would it be to enter the city to deal with an orientation of the major, uh, major uh, thoroughfares. Uh, many, many things that uh, would, in a sense, what I use a term, uh, pan amize the city of Indianapolis, and more importantly, give a sense of unity or a sense of a unified image to both the urban and sporting venues in the city of Indianapolis. And we basically had very little direction. This was, if you will, a design brainstorm session of probably the largest magnitude that certainly this school has seen. And I would venture to say that almost any school of architecture and planning has seen in the United States. Um, that's where the real learning takes place, obviously, the student to student, and of course that design process where the student deals with his or her own process at that time. It didn't take long for many things to begin to appear. Obviously, the sixth floor was festooned with banners, and suddenly the College of Architecture and Planning started to become, if you will, a Pan Am site. We combined our traditional college Christmas lunch with a major exhibition of student work. And you need to realize that students, and again, I don't have to say this to all of you that took part, but, but for the freshmen and visitors that our students started cold on December the 2nd and basically this is what they delegated for the uh, wonderful ceremony that took place in our atrium on December the 18th. We combined lunch. There were 22 visitors from Indianapolis, planners, the look committee, executive committee members, uh, the mayor of the fort, uh, the head of DMD, all the people that would be working with planning and design decisions in the coming seven months. And I would have to say I think that the College of Architecture and Planning looked really spectacular on that day. I think it gave the visitors here some notion of what Pan Am sites might look like. So if you will, we used our own environment here. It also was very important because a class under uh, Professor Vernon in landscape, in, uh, landscape architecture, Professor Segedy in planning, really took it upon themselves to deal with the whole orientational problem inside this building. How do you get visitors to various parts of a venue? And so our building, if you will, began to serve early on as a test pattern. There were tremendous reviews with visiting critics, uh, Jonathan Hess and Eric Fulford from Browning Day Mullen Theodore viewing some of Bob Kester's work on there, on the uh, left slide there, and the various uh, freshmen actually exchanging ideas uh, amongst themselves, the fort being reviewed on the right, and various other uh, design props. So the whole building from 1.30 until 3.30 was a massive uh, critique session, a massive sharing of ideas. And it was really a very, rather spectacular kind of notion, and I think that the Paxi Look Committee was uh, thoroughly snowed by the if you will, by the amount of work. And the thing for me that was exciting is to see the range of involvements, all the way from Professors uh, Segedy and Vernon looking at the city as a whole. How do you get people exiting an interstate and being oriented to where to go? How do you deal with the whole idea of urban, Im Im uh, urban imagery, which is what cities have to deal with every day, whether they're hosting an international sporting event or not. And from that scale, we dealt with arrival at the airport, a very important urban entry point, if you will, since the airplane was the major source of transportation or the major mode of transportation, and what might happen inside the various airport uh, terminal buildings. Professor Daniel Doze worked on that. Uh, Professor Egging's second year class 
did a lot of work in terms of entries, in terms of orientation, the idea of creating a sense of place in what were massive urban sites, massive sporting sites, and of course the village, which we'll talk about more in detail, the idea of converting a military post, namely Fort Ben Harrison, into a uh, Pan Am village. Um, what I thought was neat, and you've got to keep these images in mind if you would, is that the spirit captured in this watercolor drawing on the left, the author of whom I do not know, you need to keep this image of what could happen to major lighting stanchions and what could be the spirit. And what's important is to look at the spirit and the vitality of these second year studies and then look at, which is also here, please remember this image on the left, second year design work, beginning to do the to deal with what David Lewis called talk pieces, pieces that people can sit down and discuss what could happen through the use of fabric to take a light post and suddenly make it into a very festive uh, totem. But also, what's very nice is that the fourth year class under Bob Kester was dealing with the same idea of the, of the, uh, the entry. And yet you can see that there's a lot more investigation of the sophistication of entry and of course the overlaying of how do you structure an entry, okay? So that to me was very exciting is to see the various levels of design development as illustrated in second year work and fourth year work and yet they are basically exploring the very same notion of how do you define entry, how do you define a sense of place and you might want to take a look at this schematic space frame in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, those are the kinds of design ideas that were in fact very happily carried to ultimate uh, fruition. The first year project, of course, was very good to explain process, and I think that's what we're really about as professional educators and as public education. We need to be about explaining process. The product will speak for itself, but the idea of explaining the research that the freshman students went through was as important as, as presenting the banners. The fact that quick mock-up models, and the freshman students built these mostly in one day, showed the wide array that uh, information kiosks and ticket booths and so on and so forth could take. Uh, some of Andy Seeger's students came up with some very nice ideas about how to really develop a festive uh, finishing line viewing area for the Eagle Creek growing site. And Professor Woodfin's students, as uh, Trista Kibbe put it, tried to make a spectator sport out of a non-spectator sport because yachting takes place two miles off the coast unless you have fantastic vision, you're not going to get a real gut feeling for what the races are. But how do you make this, the shoreline a more interesting place for people to be? And for me, the most exciting thing was that for the first time, people were introduced uh, to a project that I think uh, simply overwhelmed the imagination, but in fact, there was one that uh, came to fruition as well, and that is Professor Alfredo Maser's class uh, dealing with the idea of uh, geoglyphs. Uh, the idea of large earth graphics building upon the wonderful heritage of South American, pre-Columbian Indian cultures, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Bachi Fernandez, who was from uh, Bolivia, also added another resource from her own country. And uh, I think these will speak for themselves. What's wonderful is Professor Maser's students showed how they could be done, how you could actually lay these out, which would become very, very critical elements later on in the process what you can do by planting two different crops in different ways, uh, what you can do with the simple idea of having a farmer participate in using the earth as a canvas and a different crop as the uh, palette. Very, very exciting project. Uh, it was my goal personally to make sure that this college got maximum mileage out of these, out of this incredible student involvement. I have been involved with hundreds of students and dozens and dozens of projects. And I always feel that these projects are a very wonderful vehicle for the public to find out what this college is about and the incredible creative talents that are in this college, both in faculty and students. And so from the first day, we dealt with both the newspaper media and medium and obviously with uh, TV, uh, Jim Nickerson from our own channel uh, 49 and uh, Ball State. Uh, this is my very sophisticated computer critical path method that I use uh, to plan out what might happen after December uh, the, uh, the 18th. As you can see, this uses the latest in both software and hardware capabilities. Uh, 
And those are my rough notes during Christmas vacation of, oh my gosh, what do we do now? We have some people really excited in Indianapolis, and I think they want us to continue. In fact, uh, Ari Egink and I went down the morning of the 19th, which was Friday morning. We actually took down two van loads of models and drawings. They were set up at the Lilly Endowment headquarters, and we presented about a quarter of the work that had been done here in this college to the executive committee. The nicest thing about it is we got to spend 20 minutes alone with Mr. Jim Morris and Mr. Tom Lake from the Lilly Endowment, who I think were utterly overwhelmed at the quality of the design work that had turned out here. So I came back realizing that we were going to have to make good on our promise that this college, in fact, could potentially help to execute and design in detail a lot of this wonderful design talent and thinking. Well, several things happened. Professor Mendelssohn and his fourth year urban design studio continued working the entire quarter on an absolutely monumental project, namely the planning and design of the look for converting Fort Ben Harrison into the uh, Pan Am Village. And the magnitude of this project was, was, was absolutely uh, uh, huge in the sense of all of the things that had to be uh, considered. Uh, at this point, of course, the students under Professor Mendelssohn were still dreaming. They were looking at these wonderful uh, tent structures that could be bus terminals, that could be uh, part of the festive uh, uh, temporary structures that would have to house literally an entire uh, small city. Um, but the meetings that took place in this very room, at least in that back room there, uh, really began to show that as, as this project got further and further along toward reality, that there were going to be some very, very hard decisions that had to be made. And uh, I want you to take a look at the look on these people's faces and where they're pointing. And you're probably wondering who they're pointing toward. And yes, they're, they're pointing to Professor Mendelssohn, who is on this side, trying to explain that the Pan Am Village had to be a home away from home for what was supposed to be 5,500 athletes. I think most of you know more than 6,000 showed up since the fort was such a wonderful place to be. Um, uh, but Professor Mendelssohn and his class, having been invited to sit in on this project, were dealing with reality here. They were dealing with budget, with time constraints, and very importantly, with the unbelievable security that we came to find out was going to override every decision for the Pan Am Games, both at the fort and elsewhere. And I think whenever an officer opens his blouse, which I believe is the official name of what we would call the jacket, you know that things are getting uh, to the short strokes, as we like to say. So um, I would have to say that Professor Mendelssohn's class uh, really, really undertook this project with an unbelievable amount of seriousness and unfortunately many times had to deal with not knowing exactly where either the Fort Administration or the Look Committee or PAXI were uh, coming from. Certainly, they wouldn't tell us what kind of dollar amounts they had, let alone what they actually saw as being an approach. So here we were really dealing with reality, and it is a uh, testimony to our fourth-year students in that section that they handled themselves better than any professional office could. I was at a meeting down at the Paxi headquarters in which they presented their uh, tent structures to Anchor Industries, that it's in the profession of making tents. And later, their executive vice president told me that our students knew more about tent structures than almost any of the architects that they deal with uh, in their uh, professional practice, which uh, I'm going to say that that means that our students had really done their homework and knew how to talk in the uh, technical language. Um, what, kept, what kept happening, of course, is we'd come out of meetings and we'd ask the big questions like, who will build it, if you'll notice? Who's going to build this? Uh, students, is there money for it? And I kept saying, We're, it's got to get done. Somehow these things have got to get done. There is too much Ball State student work to have gone into this just to let this thing fall by the wayside and have some architectural office come in now with even less time than we have and less resources and uh, take it over. So once again, you can see the use of highly sophisticated computer software in order to organize all the projects. What Stan Mendelssohn's students also dealt with, of course, was reality. We dealt with anchor industries and 
I called up my very, very good friend, at least at that time, Ed Ria, from the Unistrut Corporation. He is the Indianapolis representative. And I said, Ed, do I have a project for you? Uh, and in fact, I think uh, Ed uh, now simply puts calls on hold when I call from now on, and I simply do not get through to him. But uh, Stan students, both in the remainder of the winter quarter and then five selective students that continue during the spring quarter, actually began to translate their design work into reality, into manufactured off-the-shelf products because time did not in any way allow for any custom work to be done, certainly in the, in the uh, tent. Uh, uh, and we dealt with Anchor Industries, and of course, Stan students began to continue to work with that. We worked with the Unistroid Corporation. And as I mentioned, students got down to actually figuring out each and every component of each and every design uh, uh, submitted. So certainly, in terms of a typical academic exercise, this particular project went much further than any project normally ever goes. Both Ed, who's the gentleman on the left, and John Shaheen, who is on the right over there looking younger than our freshman, although he's been a registered architect for 11 years, came down, John from Wayne, Michigan, their headquarters, and brought this wonderful little toy with them. It's basically a model in which you build uh, mock-ups of space frames. And uh, John and Ed spent an entire day with Stan students beginning to try to translate into reality some of the ideas of gateways. You look pretty good there, Ed. Uh, another project that was also a hands-on experience was the awards platform that Professor Jeff Culp designed, and along with uh, Dave Barefoot from our uh, wood shop, built a full-scale mock-up. And as you can see, again, this project went a lot further than a typical academic exercise, a set of, if you will, material specifications on the right. Unfortunately, this project, because of cost and workmanship, did not come to fruition the way it was hoped to. But I want all of you to see the model and the original drawing out in the exhibit, which is outside, to see what the original concept was for a modular approach, building again on the idea of the X as a visual theme. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to inform people. The Ball State News Service did a very good job for us getting stuff out. Uh, I tried to keep the faculty and students informed, although probably not well enough since I would be stopped in the hall and asked a lot of questions. I was spending so much time doing, I probably wasn't spending enough time uh, trying to um, tell about it. Uh, but we began to get results. Uh, the January and February issue of both PA and ARC record carried at least news mentions of our involvement. And Campus Update and Indianapolis Monthly carried very, very nice articles. So people began to become aware that Ball State was taking an active part. Um, I got to do some very nice things, including having a backwards cover here. Uh, I got to attend on behalf of the college the first day issue of the official Pan Am stamp, and that was one of the really nice things, one of the assets of being the project uh, director. And I had never been to an official ceremony like this before, but it is, uh, it is really a wonderful event. And the, uh, the artist, Lon Bush, was there, and uh, it, was, it was really quite, uh, quite wonderful to, uh, to see that. Uh, what would happen, of course, is I'd get these wonderful letters from Dave Shane. Tony, we need some help. We need help uh, telling Bill Rizzi, who runs a greenhouse up in Logansport, how many flowers of each, and I'm talking thousands of flowers, to plant so that all of the sport logos can be planted when the games come. Of course, you've got to plant the seeds a lot earlier. So Vic Landfair and Sean Spencer, along with Dave Shane on his vacation between winter and spring quarter, put into the computer, and this I will give the computer, I will bow down in front of all of you to it. This was an incredible project in which the computer plotted all of the sport grams being input by Sean and Vic and, uh, and Dave Shane, and then was able to give a count. So we knew how many potted plants we needed of each color in order to, for them to plant them so they could be ready. And that's a massive undertaking. And this is some case where if we didn't have the computer, we would have at least have to use two or three pencils. So it was very, very important that uh, that, that took place. Now, I'm not kidding. I want you to know that I was extremely well organized, as both of these pieces of literature will show, two massive notebooks, a note outside my office letting anybody know that I could be reached anywhere. Those of you that know me personally, however, know that, of course, this was more the reality of the situation. That is a 
picture of my desk with phone memos. I can go back in my desk and let's see, a half inch down is March, three quarters of an inch is last December, and that is all my phone memos from the Pan Am games. Uh, this is what wonderful Secretary Liu used to come into every morning since I usually left here at six. And this would be a typical memo to Lou. Could she possibly do these 47 things during the day because I cannot be here? And um, Lou was just unbelievable in sometimes answering fairly irate phone calls and always making excuses for me. And um, she really did a wonderful job. And I say that because I want you to realize that people like Dave Barefoot and Lou Whitehair, who are staff members in this college, play a very, very vital role in this massive educational experience. It's truly a total uh, college effort. Uh, we were also asked, could we help with this downtown proposal for uh, building owners to fix up stores? And so we had crews go out. We developed this very quick and dirty kind of, kind of inventory sheet, although I think it holds great promise. And the student chapter was able to muster some students. And we did about 45 blocks in which we recorded every urban element on a sidewalk. And on the right, you can see every elevation of an abandoned building so we knew how many windows had to be mashed out. And this is really a major urban inventory. I'm not sure how many cities actually have this kind of an urban inventory. We did it, what I like to say, quick and dirty, but it certainly served its purpose later on. Ah, yes. The Pan Am Look Committee had to present to the Executive Committee the idea of what the look would be. They were faced with the drawing that you see on the left, which could be anywhere USA. That's presented by the uh, uh, decorating firm that had been hired by Paxi. The drawing on the right was done uh, by a collection. It's actually done by, I believe that is Tom Cheeseman's drawing. Two students, fourth year students, Tom Cheeseman and uh, John Salzman, along with myself, did a series of renderings that Paxi could present to the executive committee to show what Indianapolis would look like with the proposed look. And I, these, the originals are outside. I would like to believe that when you do a rendering on the left that is a realistic uh, drawing, that you give some people a feeling of what something could really be versus the Anywhere USA kind of graphics. So for th those of you that are taking graphics courses, you realize that the before and after or the existing and the proposed is a very, very good way to try to capture the spirit, if you will, of what is proposed in terms of the look. And here are some of the other drawings. And it was incredible to go when they were done and to see the fact that these drawings, I think, did begin to present a realistic idea of what the light stands. If you remember that second year drawing, the second year drawing is the idea, the concept. And that's what was important. That's what put the seed in people's minds. These drawings simply bring it to fruition in terms of a realistic approach to it. And of course, we dealt with the interior of the venues as well. We did a lot of work with banners. I, I am bannered out, to be very honest. And I'll tell you a long story about banners. But we dealt with street banners, once again, using highly sophisticated computer graphics on the left. And uh, you can see the memo on the right. We did a lot of quick and dirty stuff. Uh, you can tell again, I would, I would hope that the drawings that we did began to deal with a more realistic assessment of what light poles might be and, and uh, what, uh, what they could be here. Um, five students also, uh, Vic Landfair, Sean Spencer, Rich Thompson, and uh, Brian um, Hostetler, in two nights built this model that you see. It's, a, it's an interesting model in that it's a prototypical street scene in which the system of what were to be uh, confetti banners going into sport grad banners were, were, were worked out. And that was the kind of time constraint we had. We had to have that model built and delivered downtown in uh, two days, a rather massive effort. Uh, the drawings were very, very quickly whipped out. Uh, the drawing on the left that you see is a drawing that basically was executed in about three hours. So uh, we became very, very facile at getting graphics turned out, we think, quality and quantity-wise. I need a change of phrase, please. Uh, right now, we are about at mid-spring quarter. Uh, there are a lot of projects that we are juggling. We're trying to plan out the, uh, the uh, remainder of the spring quarter. Uh, and one of the things that we did is we began to build mock-ups. 
Uh, we began to, with Exhibition Decorators, which is the graphics house, we began to build one-of-a-kind mock-ups of what would work better, black or white. How would it read if you printed white ink on one side of vinyl? Would it read as black on the other? And as you can see here, a banner that was in my front yard, uh, we began to know some things about color. Unfortunately, time prevented the, uh, the uh, production of anything but the taxi banner, and I think you will see those are quite prevalent. Uh, we also begin to work on the idea of flag stanchions using Unistrut to support uh, the awards uh, uh, flags at the IU Natatorium. The space frame never came to fruition, but they did use the Unistrut basically as the, as the flag device. Uh, Professor Messer continued working with uh, Burris students using the snow as the canvas and its feet as, its feet as the palette or rather as the, uh, yeah, the palette, to begin to explore the idea of geoglyphs. And uh, the idea of the geoglyphs suddenly came under the auspices of uh, Janelle Strayer, who uh, has earned the title Ms. Geoglyph. Uh, you will meet Janelle later. Janelle basically took a four-credit independent study course to help me administer and Professor Messer the geoglyph project. She did about 40 credit hours worth of work because, as you will see, she simply made that project happen. Part of it was trying to organize the federal government with the PIC program. Any of you that come from farm families, you know that that's trying to move Mount Everest. Uh, you learn to use certain words, and uh, uh, Dave Shane and Sid Weedman were very concerned about people on the interstate, uh, Professor Segedy and Vernon's. Uh, study had really alerted them that the image of a city is first obtained when people enter, let's say, the outer loop of 465. So Tom Cheeseman and John Salzman and myself spent about two days, and we put together a modest proposal. And as Dave Shane says, architects never come up with modest proposals. And I'm just going to quickly go through these, some of the ideas of what might happen. Again, using the very quick photographic technique, doing a Xerox and simply doing some Prismacolor over Xerox. I realized that I was going to have to come good on my promise that we could get Ball State students for the summertime. And the only way I could get Ball State students was to get somebody else to pay for them. And so what we did is working through the Indianapolis chapter of the Indiana Society of Architects, we asked offices to sponsor a student for a week that was working in their office as a summer intern or simply a summer employee. Um, uh, we felt this was a way that the profession could take part in the Pan Am games. Uh, five offices did come through. That doesn't sound like a lot, but I can tell you that the students that they sent played, sent played a monumental role in giving us full-time students, more than full-time students, eight until eight more than a full-time day in 90-degree heat. And so this was one of the ways that Ball State made good on its promise that we would help to erect the uh, Unistrut space frame components that were being negotiated at that time. One of the nice things is you will see, uh, some of you may remember Zed, who was one of our graduates, but he had to do his internship. Um, and uh, the gentleman on the right is Jim Thompson. He's a University of Illinois student. We had two University of Illinois students sponsored by offices. And that was really nice for our students to get to work with students from other schools as well. Uh, we also had three interns hired by Paxi during the summer, uh, Todd Reinhardt and uh, Tracy Crum and uh, uh, I'm sorry, Give Andy McCleary. Thank you, Andy. And um, uh, they were hired full time. They worked for Paxi, but they also were hired by exhibition decorators to make sure that they worked 20 hours a day. And uh, they really did a lot of work. They, they certainly earned their uh, $300 a month uh, stipend. Uh, they helped to install the look. And that was very, very important since this did not mean getting up on a six foot ladder. This meant really uh, hanging things in some very, uh, very uh, precarious. In the meantime, of course, we had 76 original banners that were to be hung in Indianapolis. That was a promise to freshman students. We uh, mounted.
founded a rehabilitation studio. It was like a uh, preservation of the banner studio. Uh, this was the entire sixth floor, and we were given this wonderful scaled space. This is to be the skating rink on the right. That's Dave Shane saying, do something, will you, Tony? Um, and uh, saying, sure, this is a great space. Boy, you really know how to give us a wonderful environment. Obviously, this is to be a skating rink. It became the International Press Center, and so uh, we did what had to be done. Uh, this is uh, Tony Mull, who is now opening up a Chinese laundry, uh, who, who along with um, uh, Jeff Rawlins and myself, that's my wife's iron there, uh, being used, uh, actually reconditioned all the banners that had been moved around. Uh, these are all the banners being strung uh, in, the hall, in the hall. And then uh, Sean Spencer and I and Rob Lever and several other students up on top of 35-foot painter scaffolding. Um, that's the first banner to go up, and it was really neat because that was the first piece of Ball State work to go in place for the games. And I think it meant, I know it meant a lot to me that there was finally Ball State work coming to fruition on the site. So uh, that was really a fun day, and you can see that I think the banners transformed what was a, a rather mundane space uh, into at least a very, very festive space. And uh, uh, that's one of the roles, obviously, of banners and uh, graphics and streamers is to a sense of vitality in what otherwise is a very, very dead space. Uh, we also, believe me, we worked very hard at silk screening all the banners. There were 40 banners that were selected for screening, a limited edition, and these were the students whose banners were selected. Uh, we began to deal with the silk screening process. How far do you have to run ink by and what size were the banners to fit on standard light poles and so on and so forth. Um, again, Tom Cheeseman and John Salzman did a monumental job of redesigning the banners so that they would be more simple. We had to limit it to two colors. They had to be done in a way that we eventually had to hand cut every stencil, as you will find out. And they produced what you see on the left for every banner the photo-ready artwork that was to be originally shot by camera in order to make the screens. Um, the reason that no name appears on the left is because we wound up not being able to do 40 banners, but because the silk screen house in Indianapolis couldn't come through, we brought them here to Muncie, we did 15 banners, and we removed the names, and suddenly the country banners became Pan Am images, which is what's known as problem solving on the run. Uh, I called up Ann Carter, who's the woman in the middle here with the blue, and uh, she runs Sign Right, which is a very small sign, custom sign house here in Muncie. We, I told Ann that in four days she had to produce 150 banners, 10 banners of 15. Any of you that do silk screen, you know that's a monumental task. We had flown in from California overnight $1,600 worth of special enamel uh, vinyl fabric, uh, air freighted in so that Ann could work on that particular fabric with her. And uh, they did just an unbelievable job of getting the banners done. It was truly an absolutely monumental effort right here in Muncie in order to produce the banners. I'm going to show you the banners. I don't think anything has to be said about their graphic impact. what was really nice was to see the banners finally in place. For some of you that watched national TV, the banners did make national network, CBS TV, and they were referred to by one of the announcers from CBS Sports in touring through the dining tent. And he came into the tent and he talked about the, there are banners. He said a wonderful, a nice uh, presentation. The nicest thing is we got to hang these banners in the tent while the athletes were there. The games had already started by the time we were able to get into the tent. And that was really nice because we had some very nice occurrences where uh, when we hung the uh, Canadian banner and about 30 seconds later I felt a tap on my shoulder and it was a female Canadian athlete who 
gave me the uh, Canadian pin and said, that's a job well done. And that alone was worth all the effort that was put in by uh, the students, uh, certainly Ann Carter and her crew, and then the people that, that, that helped hung them. So uh, I, the only unfortunate thing is we did not get the 40 done, but I think the 15, uh, in a sense, are by surrogate the freshman class project. And I don't think there's a finer group of graphic banners produced for any games anywhere than these. Uh, what was really neat is to see projects come to fruition totally by coincidence. Sean Spencer, one Saturday morning, got to see the drawings produced by Dave Shane and Vic Landfair and the Ball State computer being used in the field to do the plannings. And I think that's what makes probably a designer the most happy, is to really see design coming to uh, fruition. Uh, I know it doesn't look a lot like Amigo, but that's Amigo on the left. And one of the sport grams on the right. The fact that you can't read them exactly as sport grams probably isn't as important as the fact that flowers, by the way, played a major role in creating the image of Indianapolis, and they still are down there. And I have to mention uh, Diana Cartwright, a landscape architect from uh, Browning Day Law and Theodore, who did an incredible job at Fort Ben Harrison. Uh, planting thousands and thousands of flowers to help, in a sense, bring spirit and life. Flowers, I think Pan Am showed, could become a marvelous type of, of feature to truly lift the spirit. I think flowers have a very, very wonderful effect uh, when used this way. You can see some of the great planners uh, that were done along by the IU Natatorium. Synchronized swimming, by the way, on the left. Um, I also have to mention I, I also have to mention, although this was not part of the Ball State effort, Professor Les Smith from the Landscape Architecture faculty, who I'm not sure how many people know, donated hundreds of hours to the equestrian site down in Monroe County and did an absolutely incredible job of helping to design and then providing the very important graphics. And I'm sorry that's upside down. Those horses are going to have to be spectacular. Um, uh, but did an incredible job. And I, I say that because I think most of you know that over 30,000 volunteers donated something to the games in terms of time. It's people like Les that donated a very, very, obviously a very specialized skill that really made certain projects come to fruition. So certainly uh, uh, he is an example of a, of a volunteer for the Pan Am Games in the uh, truest sense of the word, getting absolutely, I think, realize nothing in terms of financial remuneration for his efforts. So, Les, I applaud you for that effort. Uh, and of course, what's also very nice, and I know Les went down there, is to finally see that work. And this, the horse is right. Uh, uh, and to see that work come to fruition, and I understand uh, was very, very highly, very highly regarded course, and received many, many compliments. Another gentleman who I'll introduce in a short time is Steve Renner from Nostalgic Neon. Uh, Steve called me, I guess, about January. He told me he had sent his credentials to Paxi. I said, that's great, so did 4,000 other people. He said, you know, he said, my neon is really neat. I said, I know you did, you've done some pieces for the Energy Center and for one of the previous London uh, Polyarch exhibits. He said, do you think there's a place for a neon in the Pan Am look? I said, absolutely. The city is going to be used at night as much as the daytime. We got him in touch with Dave and with Sid Weedman. A number of months passed. Nothing happened. We finally got together, and I said to uh, Steve that he would have to probably, out of his pocket, build one or two of them just to show how spectacular neon could be. He did. And on Sid Weedman's front lawn, with an extension cord running out of his living room, as Steve will attest, uh, we showed Dave Shane and Sid Weedman uh, uh, a Paxi symbol and a sport gram. And uh, in the uh, Pan Am Tower, which is the sports corporation, uh, Steve Renner executed every sport gram, and, uh, which is probably one of the largest neon uh, commissions. And certainly anybody that knows that site and knows that building knows that these are, are very, very uh, tr a tremendous addition to the vitality of that tower. And in a sense, that sport corporation power becomes, if you will, a, a, a totem at night in the city, marking the Hoosier Dome, marking the Pan Am Plaza. And so lighting becomes a very, very important part of the, if you will, urban look when we think of 24-hour use of sight. Uh, I had 
had some, uh, we were invited to have an exhibit at the Pan Am Village in the uh, cultural tent, much of which is part of our exhibit. Uh, I had some very good help from Jeff Rollins getting this exhibit together. And I think we had by far uh, a very, very worthy exhibit that athletes and visitors and VIPs got to see in the tent there at the Pan Am Village. Again, showing the representative work of many of you. Um, one idea that I had, as I mentioned, was we were going to sell Ball State for these Pan Am games because so often people said, well, who did that? Well, I got the idea that if we could have the volunteers wearing Ball State hats, that people would know who was helping with the games. Bob Fisher called up Don Mays at the foundation, and we got enough money to buy 100 Ball State hats, and so the volunteers all got hats. And uh, I think any of you that have seen the uh, TV coverage realize that these certainly did a good job, and we gave out hats to the mayor. I don't want to say my life was influenced by Pan Am over the summer, but you can see the On the Green Symphony on the right there, and you can see my front yard. Now, I don't want to say that I ate, slept, and drank Pan Am, but it certainly did play a fairly major role in my life. Um, we began to get real reinforcement. The article in Inland Architect, which many of you have seen, an entire issue devoted to Indianapolis, a four-page article written by uh, uh, Kay Franklin from Beverly Shores, uh, one of the nicest articles and one of the articles that really, I think, captured the spirit of what Ball State did for the games. Uh, and we also were very, very fortunate to get some just some excellent, excellent uh, uh, coverage. I mentioned um, security, and I, I, this is like a little vignette. Uh, security was incredibly tight at the games. Uh, time does not permit me to tell you all of the anecdotes about going through security other than to say we were escorted by state troopers and we had the cab van searched entirely, including the hood open and everything else, in order to gain access into sites. And as you will attest here, uh, there was no fooling around. You did what they said, especially when there are military police and Indiana State Troopers. So we had kind of fun uh, with that. And as you can see by my staff card here, I said, you know, would you buy a used car from this guy? Um, this, by the way, is an infinity badge, which means that the guy's out to, to lunch. His brain is out of some people. And if I may be so blatant as to use the bronze, silver, and gold award, I think every one of you in this room who worked on this project in any way, whether it was for two and a half weeks or donating an afternoon or a Saturday, you certainly all win a bronze medal in my estimation. And I would like to applaud every one of you for that. I reserve silver medals for, for those people that if it wasn't for extraordinary efforts of gold medal winners, uh, certainly uh, just uh, did an incredible job. Certainly to Ed Rhea and John Shaheen and Bill Sitzman of uh, Unistrut, your executive people, um, an unbelievable job of a corporation that wanted to be a part of the games. Ed will tell you the negotiations were not always uh, filled with smiles, but everybody hung in there. And I think you can realize that the Unistrut made a tremendous, tremendous difference in terms of the sense of uh, the uh, Pan Am Village. To Stan Mendelson and to his, his students, all I can say is thank you, buddy. Uh, and thank all of you for your incredible work. Uh, I know at times there was a lot of disheartened kinds of feelings when you really didn't know what was coming off, uh, who was saying what to whom, and was this thing ever going to get uh, built and stuff. But uh, to every one of you uh, who were in his studio, and to Vic Landfair and Mike McCormick, Rich Thompson, Al Tradler, Brian Hustetler, uh, certainly who did uh, just unbelievable yeoman work. Um, I have to thank Tom Cheeseman and John Salzman, who uh, worked with me specifically on graphics. And uh, I'll tell you one thing about being a teacher is that you're also a student. And what's wonderful is to work with students that make you do your work even better. And the, the graphics that I produced were immeasurably helped by working with Tom and John. And so to both of them, uh, silver medals for doing just, just unbelievable uh, graphic work that, that played a, a monumental role along with the model that Stan students built in convincing the executive committee that the look was a, necess a necessity at all. 
to people like Jeff Rawlins and uh, Tony Mull and, and uh, Jeff Pyle, um, who did whatever we asked of them. Uh, Jeff went down and one day alone spent 12 hours walking in front of every abandoned building inventorying them. Not a glamorous job, but it had to be done. That's the kind of effort that made the Ball State team, I think, um, what it is. Um, to Lou Whitehair, my secretary, um, as you can tell, uh, she is sure glad these games are over. Um, Whitehair uh, really, uh, if it wasn't, it is now. Um, and to all the Geoglyph volunteers, every single one of you was the greatest volunteer effort I've ever seen in terms of people taking time out from class and studio, uh, 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 and, and studio props, by the way, being very willing to, uh, to do that. Uh, an incredible effort, obviously, uh, led by uh, 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 Janelle Strayer. To Ruth Ann Gordon, Kim Hood, Scott Miley, uh, and uh, Kay Franklin, um, good press, as they say, and, and good press is important uh, because what it does is it, it lets the world know the, uh, the design talent that is, uh, that is in this building and the stick to of, of making things happen. To all the faculty and the staff, to Bob Fisher, Jeff Hall, the administration, uh, this thing does not happen without the support of, obviously, the people in this building that make this building work. And uh, to all of them, uh, just an unbelievable job. Uh, I reserve the gold for very special people. Uh, uh, and these are people that, that I consider to be uh, just simply uh, have shown me what I consider to be Herculean efforts. The first one goes uh, to Dave Shane, who unfortunately could not be here. Dave is on his way to London to reintroduce himself to his wife, uh, since he was absent for about four months. Uh, and any of you that, that worked with Dave, you know that there's a man of extraordinary talents who probably, uh, if they rewrote the definition of the word volunteer, they simply have to put, in my estimation, Dave Shane. Um, to uh, Janelle Strayer, uh, who simply would not let the geoglyphs not get done. And uh, any of you that worked with Janelle, uh, you've got to realize she sacrificed graduating on time uh, and lots of other things. Uh, the registrar doesn't know that yet, but uh, that's, that's true. Just an unbelievable effort. To Rob Pleva and Sean Spencer. And I, I put the two uh, together um, because they would do anything I asked of them, uh, literally. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an early morning person, as some of you know, and um, when I say we've got to meet at 5.30, uh, we've got to meet at 5.30, and they would meet me at 5.30. It was great with Bob because he just lived in the building for two months, so all I had to do was go down to his uh, condominium up there on third floor, and uh, Bob was in. Um, but to Rob for his incredible uh, photographic talents, uh, uh, but more importantly, when photographs weren't needed, he would do whatever else was needed. And to Sean Spencer, uh, also, just an unbelievable effort at doing whatever had to be done. Some very unglamorous things, uh, just you know, acting as a delivery person. Uh, but those things had to get done, and they had to get done on that day. Uh, to my two sons, uh, Mario and Andy. Mario, who was a, who was a freshman, who was a sophomore at the Brebuff in Indianapolis, who, do, who donated a week of his time, and uh, just did it. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciated that. I would like to think that uh, I guess as fathers we lead by example. So I, um, I really hope that that um, uh, worked in that case. And to my little one, Andy, who uh, was always about 25 feet behind saying, slow down, dad, and uh, trying to keep my language at least acceptable in uh, some very unacceptable situations, um, I also give him the gold medal because uh, he did uh, yeoman work. Um, there's only one person that, as far as I'm concerned, gold is not uh, good enough for. To my wife, Carmen, who put up with basically an absentee husband for three months, um, I simply do have something for her. And uh, she gets the uh, Diamond Award. So she can open that whenever she wants to. Uh, all I can do is uh, hope that she doesn't have the baby here tonight. And. Um, uh, simply say thank you for, for absolutely being the best friend I could possibly have. With that, to all of you.
The most important thing is if I have forgotten anybody, I apologize. I, I almost didn't want to do this. Uh, I have been putting slides in since 2.30 this morning. As you can tell, we didn't do too well on the ups and the downs and the rights and the lefts. But I think these slides are in order. Uh, they are to music. Uh, I'd like you to try to listen because the words are meaningful. Uh, to my wife, Carmen, who doggedly found these two pieces of music on Saturday, and to Rod Underwood, who, uh, who in fact had one of these pieces in his archives. Uh, this is dedicated to my family and to, to all of you who are part of the team. <laughs> 